Um, maybe no time. I, I, don't, I can't ever remember a time uh, since I've been in ministry, which is about 16 years now of actually paid vocational ministry working at a church. There's never been a time like now in which uh, people have talked to me and wanted to talk to me about evangelism. And one in which, it, maybe you don't know what that means, essentially that's if you believe in Jesus, you're going to tell somebody else about your faith in Jesus. Now, you may not tell them all the faith, all, all, every aspect of your faith, but you're going to tell them a part of that. And I've had a lot of people asking me about that. And there's, what I would say, there's a bit of a renewed interest in evangelism and talking about our faith in Jesus. And, and what I did is as I was talking with other people and trying to get a feel for why exactly is that? Why is now the time that people want to be able to share with others about Jesus, but frankly, we aren't doing it. We aren't doing it nearly as much as we need to. So why, what is going on that's causing that? And maybe you're in that place. And if you're not in that place, I want to encourage you to get in that place if you believe in Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus, or maybe you've just kind of crossed that line of faith, this is a great Sunday for you to be here because now you're going to understand why it is that Christians do need to talk about Jesus, why it is that we do need to share our faith, why it is that that is such a priority for each and every one of us. And, and to be candid with you, this isn't something that I'm all that good at. I, I wish I was better at it, um, but, but I'm not. And it's, it's one of those things that even this past week I was a bit convicted by. I, was, I, had, my doctor, my, uh, I had my daughter at a uh, soccer training uh, facility, and she was in there working out, and I was talking to the manager that was there, and, um, and in the course of that conversation, he asked me what I do for a living, and I told him, tell him I'm a pastor, and then it's kind of from there, it's sort of these weird comments like, oh, really, that's a thing? Like, what else do you do? What do you, so what do you actually do for a living? And I'm like, no, no, I get to do this. I know I only work one day a week, but it, it works. It works out. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like a football coach. They only work one day a week? I, no, I mean, you, that's not the case. But at any rate, and so I began to talk to him a little bit about what I do, but, but I, did, I felt like in the, I gave him an invite to our church, and uh, he said he might come and check us out. I don't know if he, if, if he will or not, but if you're here, Joe, come and say, hey, I'd love, to, I'd love to chat with you. But I felt like I should have said a little more than I did. And, and I think that a lot of us have those moments. We don't, may not have them every day. We may not have them every week, every month. But we have that moment where we're talking a little bit about our faith, and you know, we're thanking the Lord for something that he's done in our life, but we just don't say as much as we should. And there's this sort of this renewed interest in wanting to push that line a little bit more than we more naturally do. And so there's a few reasons for that. One is this, that there's a few reasons. One is that we know that Christians are commanded, uh, directed to do this. We know that people, that we, if you believe in Jesus, you're directed to tell other people about Jesus. That's something that you are supposed to to do. Jesus told us to do that. And we don't know exactly why exactly he said that. We don't know how we're supposed to do that. We don't know exactly what we're supposed to say. But we do know that, hey, the preacher said this at some point. I read that in the Bible at some point. I'm supposed to tell other people about Jesus, but I, I just don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do with that. And the answer is simply this, is that 2,000 years ago, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that who shall ever believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And the thing about that truth is, if you don't communicate it to somebody, they will never know it. Like there's things that you know you shouldn't do. Like there's just things that you know in life. Like you shouldn't run around naked outside when it's 20 degrees. You just shouldn't run around naked outside anyway. But, but it, <laughs> you, you just, there's just things you know you shouldn't do. There's things that you know you should do. There's just things that we know. But nobody would ever know that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into this world, born of a virgin, living a perfect life, died on a cross, three days later rose from the grave, unless you tell them. You have to. And so Jesus said, I want you to do this. Another reason that there's such a renewed interest in this topic is that because of societal concerns. And we know that in our minds that Jesus can help with some of those concerns. Whether it's fentanyl issues that we have today, I mean, and they are rampant. People are overdosing at unbelievable numbers, unlike ever before. We, we know that marriages are struggling. We know that people are wondering about their sexual, sexual identity and their, their, what, what gender they're going to identify with and, and what exactly marriage is going to look like and, and what we're supposed to support and how we're supposed to support it. And, and we don't know how to exactly connect those dots but we do know that Jesus is a part of the answer. There's just something in us that knows that. And so as we're trying to connect those dots, we realize that if G more of Jesus was in our society, then some of these concerns would be a little better than they are. And so there's just, 
We just know that Jesus can help with some of this stuff if we get him out there a little more than we are. And the other thing is this, is that we know that Jesus can, can help us have, help, help our lives to have a greater purpose. Because for many of you, and I know even at times for myself, you're just like, is this all that there is? Whenever I'm like doing something that's just random and odd, or maybe you're doing something that's random and odd, and I've had those conversations where, is all my life, is my life just going to be a spreadsheet? <laughs> have you had that thought? Is my life, is my life just going to be another dirty diaper that I have to change? <laughs> is my life going to be, you can fill in the blank. And what Jesus does is he invites us into something greater than what we're already a part of if we allow him, if we allow him into that space that we are in. And so there's just this renewed interest. And so with that in mind, I'm going to take you to my favorite passage of Scripture that is about evangelism. It's probably, maybe not if you're really experienced or, or knowledgeable about the topic of evangelism, it may not be the one that you would immediately go to, but it is my favorite verse to talk about when we are talking about this particular topic, and we're going to learn some truths that are very critical when it comes to telling other people about Jesus. And again, you may not believe in Jesus, but I think in the midst of this, you might understand why it's so important that Christians talk about Jesus. And so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 1, and it's here that we're going to begin where a man named Luke begins as he is writing to a man named Theophilus. And many people think that Theophilus already believed in Jesus. And he's wanting to know how exactly Jesus can become more known in this area that he has influence. And so we're going to pick up in verse 1. This is what it says there. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, uh, to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And so he's, he's showing them why it is that they should believe in him, and specifically why it is they need to go out and tell other people why they should believe in him. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. In other words, he gave them a significant amount of teaching and information over the course of those 40 days for why it is that they need to align their lives with him and this path that he has for them, and why it is that the kingdom of God needs to expand in a way that no other kingdom before has ever, ever expanded. And so he's giving them this incredible, unbelievable mission to pursue. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, and so Jesus has been motivating them, inspiring them, teaching them, loving them, caring for them over the course of 40 days. Like they're ready to go make his kingdom advance. And what does he do after he gives them that raw, 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 raw speech? He said, I want you to wait. Because you can't do this on your own. And I know you want to. And I know that you think that you can, but you can't. You need my spirit in order for what needs to happen, what is going to happen, to happen. You're not going to be able to do it by your own strength. And that is the first, perhaps even the most important, truth that you need to understand here at the very, very beginning. That when it comes to evangelism, this is what we have to understand, is that God expects us to trust his spirit because even those that were with Jesus, they saw him. They couldn't even do it without his spirit. To trust his spirit, not your strength. Yeah, how many of you, how many of you here, um, you raise your hand on this, how many of you here have to drink coffee before you get going with your day? Yeah, 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 yeah. Man, that's a lot, that's a lot of you that drink some coffee, and I know there's even more of you. All right, this is even weirder. I don't know if there's any of you. How many of you drink a Red Bull before you get going with your day? Anybody? Anybody like that? Okay, all right, that's good. That's good. That's not good for you. But but we but there's a lot of you that drink coffee, and some of you will go as far as to say is don't talk to me until I drink coffee. Okay? Don't even look at me until I get that coffee in me. Because you know, you're not going to be able to go about your day 
without something getting you going. That caffeine clarifies, cl- clears out your mind a little bit. You know that you're not going to have as good of a day as you could have without getting some of that caffeine in you. And one of the reasons why we often don't share our faith is that we feel like we have to do it all on our own. We feel like we have to have all the answers. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We feel like we got to have it all figured out. And we got to know exactly how we're going to enter that conversation, lead that conversation, finish that conversation on our own. And so we just don't do it. We don't want to tell anybody about this Jesus has changed our life because, because we're trusting in our own strength. But if you approached maybe telling somebody about how Jesus has changed your life, the way that you just approach your normal day, it would be totally different. In the book of Zechariah, this is what it says there. This is what the Lord says. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of the heaven's army. In other words, you would be amazed at what will happen when you are willing to just say a prayer. To just say, God, I, I don't know what you're doing here now, but, but I want to be a part of it. To just say that prayer, to enter into that situation, to, to press into that conversation a little bit further, and just maybe ask somebody the question, do, do you come from a kind of a faith background? And then just see, where Lord, just see where the Lord takes it. You don't have to make it uncomfortable. You don't have to get them baptized right there. But you just press into it a little bit and just say, well, so why is it that you don't go to church? Or, or do you go to a church? Or did you go to a church? And what maybe caused you to stop going to church? I mean, you're going to find out more often than not that it's, it's honestly, well, I just like to go skiing. It's stuff like that. It's often just priorities. And they'll say, you know, I think it would be good if I got back in. Often that's it. Now, not always, but sometimes it's just we're scared that it's going to be this really dramatic answer. But more often than not, it's just... It's just not a huge priority if we're willing to trust in his spirit. There's a a a man named Roy Hessian that in the early 20th century, he was an evangelist. And he he tells this story about how there was this incredible revival taking place in England. And then he talked about how he just hit a wall in the 40s. And he didn't know what was going on, but he kept on with the revivals. But the fruit wasn't the same. And then he just, one night, he just got incredibly convicted and he realized that really over the past two to three years of him leading these revivals, he had just been relying on his, on his strength. And he said he took some time off, re-engaged God's Holy Spirit within him, re-engaged the Lord, and he said there was more fruit that came out of the last five, ten years of revivals that he had than in the previous 40 that he had been a part of. Amazing things happen whenever we're just willing to trust God. And so Jesus says, guys, I know you're ready to roll. I know you're ready to do this, but don't. You need my spirit before you go forward from here. And so he tells them to wait. Verse 6, then of Acts 1. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're saying, Lord, there is one question that the Jewish people are going to want to know. And it's simply this. Are you going to restore back your kingdom? Because that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. That the Messiah is supposed to deliver us from Roman oppression. The Messiah is supposed to place us as a nation above every other nation. The Messiah is supposed to lead us as he establishes his kingdom. Is the kingdom of God finally here? Like that is the question People are going to ask. It would, if there was ever an answer that Jesus would give them, it would be this one. But Jesus says, it's not for you to know. What? Like, this is the question they're going to ask. He says, it's not for you to know. The times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, God expects us to have some answers, not all the answers. Because that question that they asked Jesus could easily be this. Jesus, why is it that that good people live short lives and bad people live long lives? I was just having a conversation with a guy this past week. His wife and him have been battling infertility for years. And he's a Christian man, but 
gosh, he needs a lot of encouragement. They need a lot of encouragement right now. And as we stood in this gym and we're talking about it briefly, I, I didn't say anything. I've at least been in this long enough know, to know that, I mean, there's really nothing you can say that's going to make that okay. And he said, I know the Sunday school answers, but this is hard. And after thousands of dollars they've invested and all the different treatments they've gone through, they still can't have a child. It's, it's heartbreaking. Jesus, why don't you give us that answer? And he says, it's just not for you to know. Why, what about the cancer? What about war? What about poverty? What about addiction? What about my child, the prodigal that's in my family? Jesus, why didn't you give us that answer? And this was the question that people were going to ask. And, and those are kind of the questions that people ask now. Jesus, why is it that, you know, it's, why can't I be gay? Why can't I, I know people say I'm a boy, but why can't I just be a girl? Like those answers just aren't carefully expounded on in the scriptures. And he says, you know what, it's just not for you to know. But here's what we are to know. In John chapter 9, there's a man that Jesus comes to. And he heals this man of blindness. And then rather than everybody celebrating it, they condemn the man, the religious leaders, because all this happened at the wrong time, and maybe even in the wrong place. And, and so then they pull this guy in, and they start just bombarding him with questions after question, like, who is this guy, and what did he do, and is he a sinner? And, and this is what the man says. And this is kind of the answer that we need to always have just ready to pull out. That whether he, Jesus, is a sinner or not, the man said, I don't know. The one thing I do know, though, is I was blind, but now I see. And you might say, you might think, I don't know the answer to infertility. I don't know the answer for why somebody would go through infidelity. I don't know why good people live short lives and bad people live long lives. I don't know about other religions, other philosophies, and other priorities. But the one thing, the one thing that I do know, you might say, is I was once riddled and paralyzed by anxiety, but now I have peace. I thought my wife and I, my husband and I, were going to get a divorce, but we reconciled. I had no idea how my child felt. But Jesus gave me the patience to enter into that relationship in a way I never could have thought I, I would have without him. And now, now we have a relationship. I was angry, but now I'm joyful. I was lost, but now I'm found. And that is something that no one can ever argue with you about. First Peter chapter 3 says it this way, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and always with respect. So you don't have to have all the answers, but you do need to have some of them. Verse 8, he goes on in Acts 1, but you will receive power. So you need to wait on the Holy Spirit because you're going to get power, you're going to get strength. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you will be my witnesses. And that's where we got this sermon series idea as a witness. A witness is someone that goes into a courtroom and, and shares their experience. They share the facts of what it is that they have uh, gone through. And so when a court, in a courtroom, when the judge comes into the room, the bailiff will stand, will stand up and say, all rise, because the judge has entered the room. And the idea is that as a Christian, you got to rise to the occasion here, and you got to be that witness. you got to be the witness. And so here's the truth that Jesus is teaching us here, is that God expects us to be witnesses, not convincers. In other words, you just have to share your experience Whatever that experience was, that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Whatever that experience was, that's what you share. Those are the facts that you know. Don't go beyond that. You don't have to share your opinions. If you start sharing your opinions in a courtroom, do you know what the judge says? You know what the defense attorney will say or the prosecutor will say? Sustained. Don't go there. Don't say that. We don't need that. That's not helpful. 
But imagine that courtroom setting. You're meant to be a witness. On the stand is you or I who believe in Jesus. Over there, as the defense attorney, you have the counselor. I'm going to read to you from John 15 here, verse 26. That when the counselor comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. You see, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, is the one that's meant to be the one trying to do the convincing. Not you or I. We're just meant to be the witnesses. Who's the defendant? That's Jesus. He's the one on trial. Who's the prosecutor? That's Satan. He's the one that's accusing us of every, which, everything and every reason, why it is that somebody shouldn't believe in Jesus and why it is that you shouldn't have credibility. He's the prosecutor. And who's the jury? That's the world. Maybe even some of you who don't believe in Jesus. And you get to cast, they get to cast their verdict if they will believe or they won't believe. And the only thing that we have to do is receive the subpoena, go to the stands, and be a witness. It's a tragedy, though, when we forget about who we are. There's an old comedian named Milton Berle. Um, I've never actually seen Milton Berle, um, but do any of you know who Milton Berle is? Oh, my goodness gracious. All right. That, that's wonderful. So some of you know who Milton is. And, and again, he was a funny guy. He was rather famous a uh, long, long, long time ago. <laughs> but so Milton, <laughs> Milton, he got to the point where there were many people 100 years and younger who didn't know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to start going to retirement. That's that true. This, that part of it's true. He had to start going to retirement communities to, to do his act. Eventually, and, and he would always receive rave reviews. I mean, the people were ecstatic when he would come in. And he went to one particular community um, where he was going through his, his whole spiel. And he noticed, though, that there was a woman up in, near the front that was paying him no attention half asleep, some like, sometimes like I get to see with you all, but that's another story. But anyway, so she's like half asleep, not paying him any attention, just kind of looking at her watch, the clock, whatever. She couldn't wait for it to be done. And so he's offended because he's this big deal. I mean, some of you know who he is. I mean, Milton, Milton was a big deal. And so he goes up to her and he says, he goes up to her, he says, Miss, do you know who I am? Because he's, again, he's, he's just a little dumbfounded with the reception that he received from her. Do you know who I am? And and, and she says, what? He's, he says, do you know who I am? And, and he's, she just puts, his, puts, puts her hand on him and she says, sir, I don't. But if you go over to that nice nurse over there, she'll tell you who you are. <laughs> now, now it, I mean, it's a, you got to have, it's a tragedy whenever, it, it sure is a tragedy whenever people do begin to lose grip on who they were and who they are. And, and it's a, probably healthy to have a little bit of a laugh about it if you're especially if you go through that personally but but I would say it's even greater tragedy whenever a Christian forgets who they are and one of the reasons that we have not embraced this calling of being a witness the way that we should is that we think that we have to do all the convincing we we're just a part of the process and and some get to water some plant some till even some will harvest. I've, I've seen that in my own, my wife. She's much, she gets the opportunities to harvest, and I'm like grinding away, trying to dig up this hard clay soil and dealing with all that. And, and then she gets to experience more of that side of it. Everybody has a different part to play in the process. You aren't the one that has to convince. You just got to share your experience, share the facts. And then when you're done, you just walk off the stand. And then it's up to the Holy Spirit and that, that, those that are in those, uh, those people in the jury that are going to have to decide what they're going to believe about Jesus. We go on. We're going to read all of verse 8 now. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. Now, they're in Jerusalem. They're in that, that, that vicinity of that space. And you see this ripple that goes out. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The point that Jesus is, is making here is that God expects us to start where we are, not in some other country. There's a part of us that, and if you've ever been on a mission trip, 
You know what I'm talking about. If you haven't been, you need to go on one. In fact, I'd encourage you. You know, Jesus, before Jesus gave this command, the disciples spent three years with him. And then he said to them, you need to go to the ends of the earth. You need to get to the end of the earth. You need to get to other countries. You need to get to other people. That's what he said to them. In three years, you should try to make it a priority to go on some kind of a mission trip. Get into another country in the name of Jesus. But he tells them to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost regions of the world. You need to start where you're at. God has strategically placed some of you where you are, those of you that believe in Jesus. And you know where he has put you first and foremost? In your home. Maybe with a spouse that doesn't believe what you believe or a child that doesn't believe what you believe. Or maybe they have a bit of a nominal faith or maybe their faith, like my children, is very young and they're leaning into Jesus more and more so every day, every week, every month, every year of their life. And we're trying to nurture that in them. If you want revival to happen, and this is what I believe, for revival to happen in our, in our country, it has to happen in our homes. And for it to happen in your home, it needs to happen in your heart, in your life. I had that impressed on my heart years ago by the Lord. I just was praying the city that we were in for revival, for revival, for revival. And the thing that came to me in that moment was, Phil, I know you want revival in this city, but I want revival in your heart. And that's where it starts. It starts where you're at. Oswald Smith said it this way, the light that shines the farthest will shine the brightest at your home. And what are you doing at your home? How are you, how are you acting at your home? Are you, are you praying with your children? I've got, I've got dozens of devotionals that we've read through with our children and we go through and there's a variety of them. I'll recommend you, them to you. I'll give you the one or two of them if you want them. And we read through those every night, and we pray through those. And, and it's not a ton of time, but like my son, he won't go to bed until I read to him. And we've read through all the devotionals. And now we're going through the Psalms. And I don't, he, I don't know if he understands any of it, but he, God has promised his word won't return void. And so we just read through those Psalms. And we pray, and he goes to bed. And my girls, same way. Maybe it's not just that, but maybe it's just the way you talk. Are you just cussing it up, cussing up a storm at home? Are you yelling all the time and screaming? Greg Kokel and I, we talked about this with some of you last week, which that was incredible, the time he had with us Sunday morning and Sunday night. We had 212 people here on Sunday night, just people wanting to learn about how to tell others about Jesus. And what we shared, one of the things that we shared there is just that, man, you got you to, gotta, don't compromise the gospel at your home. Like, that's not the time to let loose. That's the time to step up. Let Christ's light really shine bright through you. Ask, this is what we were actually talking about there, is ask for forgiveness if you cross a line. That's going to teach your kids, you know what, that you need a Savior too. Because we're all sinners in need of, of a Savior. Start at your home or your workplace. Work at trying to make Jesus known in those spaces, in your communities, wherever you're at. Even at ball fields and other places. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And so this incredible thing has happened. Like they've just had this unbelievable mountaintop experience with Jesus. But they're just staring, they're just looking in the clouds. And then the angels say to the men of Galilee, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has taken, who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. They're saying to him, why are you waiting? You've got a mission that you need to go help fulfill, a kingdom that you need to help expand. The fifth truth is this, is that you need to start today, not sometime into the future. Because you aren't guaranteed a future. You're guaranteed right now, right here. James says it this way to us. What is your life that you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes? You've only got a little while, a little bit of opportunity. And there are people in heaven, and the theologies kind of go back and forth on this. They, they probably don't know what's happening here, but, but we'll play around with it and just pretend like they do. They are cheering for you because they have a husband. They have a child. 
they have a grandchild, they have a great-grandchild that you get to interact with. And they're experiencing eternity, and they're wanting you to tell their grandson. They're wanting you to tell your neighbor. They're wanting you to tell that coworker of, of yours about Jesus because they don't want to spend eternity away from that person. And you right now, you right now have the words of eternal life that you can share with them. And I know we can come up with every excuse in the world why we can't do it, but you should do it. You just never know. Even the hardest of hearts, you never know when someone might come around. There's a woman named Liz Curtis Higgs. She's written numerous books. She's led many uh, women's Bible studies, and uh, she's very well known. And she wasn't always like that. She lived a really, really hard life. Lots of drugs, lots of sex, and a lot of broken relationships. She hated men, to say the least. And so she attended, actually, a church that I used to work at years ago. And at this particular church, a friend of hers had been just pounding her <laughs> in the best, respectful, most gentle way, like weekly, monthly, to come to church, to come to church, to come to church, to come to church. And then finally Liz said to her, if you will stop asking me to come, if I go, will you stop asking me to come? And then the friend said, yeah, absolutely. And so Liz finally comes to church with this friend of hers. And then the preacher stands up and he has about a five minute intro and then he gets to the text and he said, the text is Ephesians 5. And he starts reading and the, friends kinda gets, the friend gets a little squirrely at this point because the text is, wives, submit to your husbands. <laughs> it's not really the, the passage of scripture that friend was hoping Liz would hear that, that day. But then he went on and he began to share the rest of that passage and he talked about how how husbands need to love their wives the same way that Christ loved the church and was willing to die for her. And then Liz kind of joked with her friend as the sermon was going on, if I ever found a man like that, I would believe in Jesus. And then the friend leaned back over to her and said, Liz, there is a man like that. And his name is Jesus. And he did love you enough to die for you. And all, of, all that just shook Liz to the core. She eventually turned a corner. After a couple months of attending church there, there was an invitation. She walked forward. And the rest is history. Millions of books later that she has sold and thousands of people later that she has spoken to, lives have been changed because there was a friend that was not willing to give up inviting this woman to church. There was a friend that was not willing to give up telling her about Jesus. And you've got people like that in your life. And there are people in heaven who are cheering you on. And you can do it. I can do it. Let's pray. Our team's going to lead us in worship. Father, we come to you now. We're grateful for all that you've given us in Christ. And Lord, uh, I pray that we would always remember how you've changed our lives. And that there are people maybe in our homes, and certainly in the communities around us who, who need Jesus too. And so, Lord, may we just trust in your spirit to lead us into those conversations in healthy ways. And God, may we be revived. And Lord knows, you know, that we, we need revival. And we give you all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.